many issues over the last couple of years. But um, what I'd really like to do is take a step back for a second and think about the basics. Nowadays, we are talking to a new audience. And that new audience are the people who used to have the stereotype in their head about what cannabis is, what marijuana was. And so we're speaking to them. We're speaking to those people who don't know what this stuff is, how it can help them. Um, they may be a little skeptical, but they're curious. They've been hearing about uh, cannabis in the news. We saw uh, some stuff on the news as we were, we were queuing up at the coffee, uh, coffee house earlier. Um, it was kind of funny because we were just sitting there in the coffee shop, and all of a sudden there's a guy rolling a um, marijuana cigarette on TV. So my question for you real quick is could you give us a little brief background of why you got involved in the cannabis industry and your interest in, in cannabis itself? I certainly can. Can you hear me okay now? I think we can. Yes. Thanks, Bob. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I had been myself one of the children that people were so, are always so worried about when it comes to marijuana. When I was 16 years old, two very profound things happened to me. One is... Uh, I started college, and the other is I started to use cannabis. And although I obviously had started, went to school rapidly in order to start college at 16, I was a very bad student. I had no study habits. And to me, studying was you flip through the pages, and you know then you were prepared, which, of course, by the time I got to college, that didn't work anymore. I went to uh, one of the city universities in New York City, and you had to have a B or greater average in order to stay there, and my first semester was, I think, a D plus average. Did you, uh, uh, did you go to City College uh, in New York? Was that Dr. Bob? Yes, yes. Me too. And I went to That's one right. of the branches, Hunter, but it was at that time Hunter in the Bronx. Uh-huh, yeah. And, and um, I, what cannabis use did for me was it made me very aware of how stupid I was, and that I... If I'm going to go to school, I should start really learning. And that sent me down the horrible road of becoming a lifelong learner. And, the, you know, I kept smoking more and more cannabis, essentially, and becoming a better and better student as I realized also that I had terrible difficulties paying attention. Uh, I'm very ADD. So what that did was, that even though cannabis is kind of contraindicated for that in many respects, to just... What it did for me was it, by my awareness, it made me focus and pay more attention. And by the time I got my PhD and I did my qualifying exams, I had the highest grades in the university system. So, and I met a number of other people over the time. Um, you know, I knew from within that cannabis was good for me. And when I moved to Vermont, I just uh, hooked up with a bunch of very good, kind people who were activists. And we started a political party, the Vermont Grassroots Party. I ran for U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate. Uh, wow. Before I ran against, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Jim <laughs> Shepard. Then in 96, I ran against Patrick Leahy. No, in 96, I ran against Bernie Sanders. And in 98, I ran against Patrick Leahy. So I became very involved. I had a live call in TV show. And, you know, you get the spectrum of kids and football teachers as well and uh, police law enforcement, and it was a really very uh, good show. It went on for four years, and it was quite popular. And what I used to do is I presented the science uh, that was known at the time. That was the era when we were first starting to really learn uh, modern science regarding um, cannabis and uh, soon to be uh, the discovery, really, of the endocannabinoid system. And so that was the mid... And so that's the mid '90s you're talking about now. Yes, yes. So '96, if I recall, was the discovery of the endocannabinoid system by Dr. Meshulam in Israel. Is that correct? Well, no, it was actually before that. It was in 1988 uh, that they were able to show via the use of radioactive uh, cannabinoids in mice. And what they did was they feed them radioactive cannabinoids, and then they slice their brains up and they put them on uh, film. And the film gets exposed. So what you were, what they were expecting is to just see a random distribution of the radioactivity. Instead, they saw that it was concentrated in certain areas. 
indicating that there was a specific binding going on. So that really said that there's, you know, that we have receptors that bind plant cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, and once those receptors were there, the question, of course, becomes, are they there simply so we can get high? And uh, the answer is kind of a yes or no. It's not so we can simply use the plant, but because we make our own endocannabinoid cannabis from within. And it was a few years later that the gene was cloned, and uh, likewise, within a few years, Shulam, who was involved in all of these processes anyway, he's really the godfather of cannabis science, having first synthesized THC back right. in 1965. Right, okay. Uh, and I, yeah, but um, he discovered these lipid metabolites, fat lipids, right? Lipid metabolites that are part of all of us, and so now we had this unique system. We had cannabinoid receptors and cannabinoid ligands, which basically says we get ourselves high to a certain so essentially what you're, what you're talking about, Dr. Bob, real quick to uh, tie this into everyday conversation, for example, there was an article I came across uh, in the last couple of months that was about uh, the endorphin, the runner's high. Um, right. And, and a lot of people think that that is endorphin uh, driven, but apparently it actually is part of the endocannabinoid system, and that's the increase of that, uh, that release of those body-made cannabinoids. Is that correct? Cannabinoids and endorphins are both released. Uh, there's a lot of crosstalk between those biochemical circuits. It turns out that uh, some of the properties of narcotics, of opiates, actually function through the cannabinoid pathway. Hmm. So the cannabinoid pathway is integral to the uh, opiate system. Well, it's, it's uh, integral to a portion of it. Okay. So it's, it's not like they substitute for one another, rather they at different times complement one another. It turns out that the reward properties of narcotics, of alcohol, of cigarettes, uh, of a number of, of drugs, of abuse, <laughs> are, are funneled through the cannabinoid system, which it makes it very interesting because what that tells me is that if all of those drugs can be, in terms of the reward properties, can be substituted by using cannabis. And that becomes profound because, I mean, after all, you know, alcohol is a preservative. It kills things so they don't grow. Uh, tobacco, we know, is the leading cause of death in America. Uh, well, the leading, leading cause of, uh, not of death in America, but it, that it kills 400,000 Americans a year through heart attacks and related illnesses. The precipitated cancer, obviously, as well, uh, by the uh, consumption of tobacco. And most people that you speak with who are tobacco addicts would like to stop it, but they find it too difficult to do it. Um, because it's part of the reward pathway. You give people cannabis, mm -hmm. and they can stop using these other dangerous drugs. Even smoking a cannabis is not the same as smoking tobacco. It does not, it's not associated with lung cancer or Pulmonary disease, um, you had, uh, you had um, published uh, an article about that in the last issue of Cannabis Health News magazine in regards to um, cannabis versus tobacco. And you bring, yeah, up, a, you bring up a really important uh, part of the conversation. You know what I'm starting to see here, for those of, uh, of the listening audience who are new to what cannabis is, is that you're revealing that there are a whole slew, a whole array of things that this plays into, whether it's um, how it interfaces in our body or what ailments it may address or how it may interface or be compared or not compared, say, to smoking. Um, you know, a quick, quick question for you. If we, if we come back to um, the bigger picture of cannabis in general, do you see cannabis as something that um, is beneficial to... The greater audience out there, um, is it something that many more people uh, that, that uh, have different ailments could benefit from? So I guess what I'm really asking is, do you mind going over a list of, really quickly of ailments that cannabis could potentially address in terms of either palliative care or preventative um, treatment? Yeah, well, let's, let me go into a little bit more of the science, and then that answer will be readily appreciated. So it turns out that this endocannabinoid system that is found in all vertebrates, 
um, that the system literally regulates everything in our body. It's, it's the energy and mass that flows through our body that keeps us alive, right? We have to always eat, we have to always get rid of our waste, and breathe, etc. And it's that flowing energy that has created, maintains all of these body systems that cannabinoids are fundamentally involved with. So whenever anybody in the world, any vertebrate in the world, not only humans, gets hungry, they get hungry because a part of their brain that controls appetite makes endocannabinoids, mm -hmm. and that gives us the munchies. So all of the effects, be it from pain or stress and anxiety, uh, hunger, or body temperature, blood pressure, all of these things are regulated by the pot that we make. And illnesses are imbalances in our biochemistry, and that's flowing biochemistry that sustains us. So cannabis helps prevent the biochemical imbalance because in general, when you're looking at all age-related illnesses, in other words, all illnesses other than infection, cannabis plays a fundamental role in relieving those illnesses, in minimizing them, and delaying their onset by virtue of how it impacts on the endocannabinoid system. If you make what's called a knockout mouse, where you can eliminate in a strain of mice, you can create a strain of mice that are lacking what's known as the CP1 receptor, which is the receptor that is in our brain and actually throughout our body. But it's in particular the receptor that gets us high, so to speak. And it turns out that if you knock out that receptor, so we have mice that are completely not high, right? The ideal for law enforcement. Those mice die prematurely. Uh, they're extremely skipsy and uptight, fearful. They don't want to move. Uh, because they're too afraid to move, they're too paranoid and depressed. And this goes very much in line with um, a, a drug that was developed known as Ravonabon, which was an inhibitor of that CB1 receptor. Mm -hmm. It was a politically correct road for pharmaceutical companies to go down because you're turning off the endocannabinoid system rather than turning it on. Right. And what their vision was was that by uh, using this anti-cannabis drug, you would inhibit diet, you would inhibit hunger, and therefore you would reduce weight and inhibit, uh, you know, metabolic syndrome and its associated cardiovascular diseases, etc. But there and were severe the results. The FDA wisely did not let that on the market in the United States. It was approved in uh, Europe and went on the market two years before it was taken off because making people unhigh is not good for them. And in fact, in such severe depression that people were killing themselves. Right. But right there, we can now see that certainly depression uh, is something that can be aided with cannabis. And, and in that situation, it's typically so potent that an inhibitor of depression that a person can take just a drag or two or three and get very rapid and immediate relief so you've from just... that, that depression. Dr. Bob, you've just, you've just hit on a couple things that have been in the news recently. And um, specific to your example right there, uh, one of the big uh, research papers that I just read, I think it was out of uh, University of Denver, addressed how cannabis in medical states uh, is showing a decrease in uh, suicide levels. Yeah, the, the irony is not only in suicide levels, but also a decrease in car accidents. And they're attributing that to a 5% decrease in beer consumption. <laughs> right, so and then there's also a 9% decrease in uh, DUI-related accidents on the road, I think also that report uh, pointed out to you. Yeah, so we, you know, we have uh, the interesting uh, situation here where if you don't support medical cannab cannabis, you're actually supporting uh, a situation that appears to promote killing, self-killing, suicide, uh, as well as higher levels of auto accidents. So real that's, quick... That's quite an interesting twist when we have legislators in Colorado who are so obsessed with, uh, with this cannabis issue. I was just going to bring one of those people up. a situation that's going to be very harmful on many levels. I was and just going to bring one of those people up. Aside from Steve King, who uh, is a senator who is uh, bringing up HB... Or sorry, uh, I guess it's SB... 117, which is the DUI bill, 
We also have uh, DA Dan May down in your district, in your area of the of the uh, state, and he is prosecuting Bob Krause as well as Elisa Kappelman. Now, real quick, we're just going to jump into a sponsor break in just a moment, but could you really quick tell us a little story about your encounter with uh, Robert um, Krause and uh, Dan May coming across your conversation? Well, I was down there with Robert Krause. We were protesting. I'm also involved in this case and that I'll be an expert witness, et cetera. And uh, Dan May did happen to walk by, and I approached him and offered to provide him with the peer-reviewed scientific articles that I would explain to him. I have a standing offer to anybody in law enforcement in that community who is interested in learning the facts from a scientific point of view rather than the insanity that is being spewed in their name. You know, the, the thing that hits me at home is that we're very involved now with through cannabis science with uh, helping people understand and use cannabis to uh, treat cancers. So we've been doing it with, in particular, uh, skin cancers, both basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. If you go to the website, CannabisScience.com, you can see four patients that we've treated with topical application uh, using these extracts, and it's mind-blowing the results. I mean, one of the patients, patient number three, had the most severe case of squamous cell carcinoma the doctors, his doctors, oncologists had ever seen. And he went through chemo and he went through radiation. He had a, literally 130-something uh, radiation treatments. And in the end, the tumors that were left were the ones that were resistant to all these treatments. And when he would go for radiation, it would make the tumors grow. So mm. they basically said, there's nothing we can do mm. to you. And in mm. desperation, he turned to cannabis. And now, literally, and this is a quote from the man, pieces of tumor fall off my head every day when I'm in the shower or when I'm in bed at night. And it's very profound, very graphic imagery. That's a uh, profound you- story, Dr. Bob. Um, I really think that people need to take a look at these images. They're very graphic. Uh, but if you go to CannabisScience.com, you can see the uh, these images from uh, what Dr. Bob is talking about and how cannabis does affect cancer. Now, Dr. Bob, we're going to jump over to a quick commercial break. And uh, when we come back, I do want to talk about your uh, presentation tomorrow at the Denver Law School at 1145 at the Storm College of Law. So we're going to roll on to our sponsors. Thank you for listening to Cannabis Health News Magazine. Trouble with the law, or maybe you're looking to start a medical marijuana business? The law firm of Edson Maiton and Matz can help. Attorneys Warren Edson, Lauren Maiton, and Chris Matz offer a wide range of criminal defense related assistance and cannabis business legal services. Call the team of legal professionals ready to help you or your business out today. 303 831 8188. That's 303 831 8188. Or check out the website warrenedson.com. That's Warren Edson, E D S O N.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Cannabis Health News Magazine. We're here live with Dr. Robert Melamed from Cannabis Science and the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. Uh, Dr. Bob, you were just talking about uh, how cannabis is helping treat uh, cancer, creating uh, an apoptotic effect. Is that right? Apoptosis is the... Uh, well, it's a variety of things, uh, probably. Uh, one, of the, you know, one of the things we know is that there are over, there are literally hundreds, around 800 peer-reviewed scientific articles that show cannabis killing cancers in animals and tissue culture models. So the miracle that's happened here in Colorado, because of medical cannabis legality, we're able to actually, you know, the state has become a big laboratory and the citizens have become the scientists. So real quick, I don't... things that pharmaceutical companies cannot do. So real quick, I don't think our listening audience heard my uh, intro in there, but I just wanted to welcome everybody back to Cannabis Health News Magazine. We're here live with Dr. Robert Melamed, and Dr. I just asked Dr. Bob about the uh, effects of, of uh, cannabis on cancer. And uh, those of you who are just listening um, and are just tuning in, he is addressing the 
hundreds of, of uh, articles and research papers that are out there that you can actually go find online. But um, what is also phenomenal, and you just mentioned, Dr. Bob, is that we really have a state of um, research happening right now. So, so real quick, uh, I really want to come back to the opportunity that people have uh, tomorrow to come see you talk at Denver Law School at 11.45 a.m. at the Storm College of Law. And that's over at 2255 East Evans Avenue. 2255 East Evans Avenue, and that's in Denver. So, Dr. Bob, coming back to... Um, and that's 11.45 a.m. Thank you for that clarification. So those of you who uh, want to join uh, Dr. Bob for the conversation, please come on down tomorrow. And Dr. Bob, um, as we started this conversation, again, addressing the new listening audience that's out, out there, what, um, what do you find is a critical conversation, or what else do you find is really important to initially get out there to people who really are just hearing about cannabis and its medicinal effects, uh, including apoptosis with uh, cancer? Understand. Let's, let's look at some of the things that happen to people who have cancer, aside from the fact that they have these tumor growth, growing. Uh, conventional therapies, chemotherapies, radiation, surgery, etc., they don't really address the underlying problem. The underlying problem is a biochemical imbalance that allows the tumors to grow. And the fundamental paradigm uh, by which pharmaceutical companies work, in my opinion, is fundamentally flawed. We and all living entities were what I call four dimensional flow dependent structures. We have this biochemistry happening in our body, hence the three dimensions, but it, they happen in a consecutive fashion where one chemical is converted into another chemical, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that gives you the time element. And because cannabis regulates everything in our bodies, when we take cannabis, it's able to impact system, the collection of molecules that each of us are, in a very multi dimensional fashion. So it's a, it has a holistic impact on our biochemistry. Whereas pharmaceuticals look to pluck one thread of this multi-dimensional flow-dependent structure. And the nature of the biochemistry is such that our body is always trying to maintain homeostasis, in other words, dynamic balance. And that dynamic balance was out of whack in the first place. And when we have, you know, when we have any illness, but in particular, we're focusing on cancer. So the system tries to correct anything that we try to do to correct the imbalance by restoring the imbalance. Whereas cannabis, in a multi-dimensional fashion, impacts on the entire system simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it's killing cancer, but on the other hand, it creates an environment in the rest of the body that doesn't the cancer. But it's a whole unique phenomena that happens when you use cannabis. And again, it goes against the conventional model of how you know, of pharmaceutical companies approaching this one thread where the body will compensate for them plucking on that one thread. So, Dr. Bob, I've got a very specific question. You brought up uh, cancerous tumors. What about um, non-cancerous tumors? Does cancer have any effect on non-cancerous tumors? Well, I've seen, for example, Robert Kraft just mentioned the other day, he talked to me, he said, Bob, do you think the cannabis I'm taking has any impact on the fact that the mole on my chest just fell off? Mm. Oh, you're kidding me. So, the answer would be yes. I, I know I had a, a mole that I've had my whole life on my arm. And over the years, now that I've become an old part, uh, it got <laughs> very dark and black, literally, and had like little white buds on it. My ex looked at it and said, oh, Bob, that doesn't look good. So I put some cannabis on it, tar on it, uh, covered it with a Band-Aid for two days, and two days later, it was totally normal skin again. And the, the bowl is still there, but it's normal still skin color. It totally transformed it just two days like that. So it, it can have a profound impact on a variety of things. But think about cancer. What happens to people? They typically are not eating anymore. They're depressed. They're in pain. They're not sleeping. There's a whole host of symptoms that go along with having cancer. And every one of those symptoms is addressed by cannabis. It has antidepressant activity. 
There's profound pain in the living activity. It stimulates the appetite, and it makes you sleep really, really well. If you go to, again, to CannabisScience.com and look at uh, patient number three, the man with this constant, horrific uh, squamous skull on his head, once he started using cannabis, because uh, he started taking some as well, uh, just so he could start sleeping, and uh, the first time he, he took a medible, he uh, told me, gee, that's the first time in three years that I slept the whole night. So it's profound for people, and it really it helps them tremendously. That is uh, absolutely amazing to me, and that's something that um, I think it's really important for people to hear, is that this is a plant that has no side effects. Uh, if you want to call them side effects, they're positive ones. Um, and if you compare it to the pharmaceutical drugs, as you brought up before, the pharmaceutical industry wants to block the receptor whereas cannabis is allowing a communication system to take place that is not running effectively or efficiently right now. I guess that's maybe a, a, a layman's way of saying it. But um, me expand a little on what you just said there because I don't want to misconvey. Okay. The pharmaceutical in, industry is not, has not only worked on inhibitors, but also stimulators of the cannabinoid system. But they're doing it with synthetics. So they're on both and extremes. That's a whole different ball game. Yeah, because okay. again, they're trying to target one unique aspect. You got to remember that the plant has a hundred cannabinoids and a whole host of other flavonoids and other Terpenes biologically and... active compounds. Mm -hmm. So again, cannabis works in a multi-dimensional fashion, whereas what they're trying to do is now again dissect the cannabis so that they can find one magic molecule that will hit another magic molecule and somehow create magic. Magic is not science, you know? Right. And that's something science. So that's something that came up um, at the Veterans Affairs Committee hearing on HB 117, the bill that Senator Steve King is proposing. That's a DUID bill proposing per se, uh, no, I, I, uh, per se standard, excuse me, with a five nanogram um, blood THC content and then a zero. This is the this is the interesting part of all this a zero tolerance for Schedule II drugs. Um, did you happen to attend that? I was, I was there early on in the testimony and got to testify uh, early on. I had to leave. Did you have an opportunity to testify at that hearing, or uh, were you aware, or did you hear anything else about that uh, hearing? Well, I, I didn't because, you know, I'm down here in the Springs, and I also have teaching responsibilities, and yeah. I have my kids. And you've got two sick boys. I'm really, really sorry to hear that they're not doing well. I just I heard about that earlier, and again, I just want to reiterate, I hope they heal up and uh, stop puking. <laughs> my, my, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Alan Shackelford, did attend, so I know that he at least will have tried to, to base a, a scientific foundation legislators. The tragedy is they're legislating things that they don't understand. So that's why I wanted to tie in this into what you said earlier, is um, unfortunately what we're dealing with is real science from your perspective and a lot of other people that are out there, Dr. Meshulam and so on and so forth. But uh, unfortunately we're dealing with politicians who don't have the education or background to understand what is science and what is not. What is uh, meta-analysis versus peer-reviewed data. And so can you speak about that uh, briefly? Well, there's a fundamental issue here. Drugs in general, prohibition doesn't work. I mean, that's become universally accepted by, I think, most nations at this point, with the exception of, I think, the United States and Russia. Uh, it's funny how that strange bedfellows there. Huh. But things are shifting in, around the world away from the prohibitionist model. Prior to cannabis being made illegal in um, 1937 and uh, narcotics, General and cocaine being made illegal in, uh, I think it was 1916 or 18 with the Harrison Act. 1917. The was illegal. Yeah. And even today, if you look on a per capita basis, there's the same amount of narcotic addiction as there was when it was legal. And, you know, most people, if, if narcotics were legal tomorrow, you know, are you going to run out of you know, start using heroin or morphine because it's legal? No. Of course people not. People who want to use it have problems to begin with. It might be legitimate problems like pain. Which we should treat as a health issue. Use narcotic. Right. Or it might just be, you know, people who, for whatever reason, have gone down the wrong path and have become uh, addicted to these very dangerous addictive drugs, which does not include cannabis. 
cannabis is not addictive in, in any conventional sense of the word. You know, most most uh, studies have kind of indicated it's got the level of addiction comparable to caffeine. So can you uh, can you speak specifically about um, that issue alone in in regards to addiction? Um, is cannabis physically addictive? Is it uh, mentally addis- addictive? And then the other real question I have about that. Is there a difference between, and obviously you and I have talked about this and I'm very well um, uh, informed on some of these issues, but can you explain to our listening audience about the difference between psychoactive tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and uh, CBD, cannabidiol? Well, first of all, I want to make a comment on something you said. Psychological versus physical addiction, there's no difference. Our psychology, our consciousness. Sorry, I meant I meant to say. From the underlying biochemistry. Thank you for catching so that. I meant to say physical. I meant to say physical addiction. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. But I just want you know that everything is physical addiction when there's addiction. Mm-hmm. And you know your psychology is part of our biochemistry. It's not independent of our biochemistry. So in, in any event, if you if you take conventional narcotics. Uh, and become addicted, which everybody does and uses them regularly, you do become an addict. At that point, uh, and this is true of recreational junkies, you know, I grew up in New York City, so I was quite familiar with, with that reality. You know, they take it at first because they get, quote, high. They get some kind of a beneficial effect that they find pleasurable, uh, which is a little hard to comprehend when you take narcotics and make you rush and constipate it. Uh, right. It was not very desirable. Yeah, at point. yeah. I remember taking my pharmaceuticals and uh, having to take all that uh, anti-constipation medicine after the morphine. Oh, it's, it's, it's totally, it's incorrect. You know, you don't need narcotics for chronic long-term pain. You need cannabis. Narcotics are great when you have acute pain. You know, you're a uh, military and you get your arm blown off. You don't want cannabis at that point. You want narcotics. No question about it. And I myself have been in the explosion as a kid. I blew myself up when I used to play with chemicals. Um, so I understand that. I was able to watch the doctors as they sewed the end of my fingers back on, brushing it. It was essentially a wire brush to turn it off. Oh, and I had no pain at all. I'm looking at you know my open finger tips, and I'm thinking, wow, this stuff really works. Uh, but when you go into chronic long-term pain, like for the rest of your life in many cases, the last thing you really need Right. are narcotics, you need cannabis, and in some cases you still need to supplement with a little narcotics. It's scientifically been shown, again, peer-reviewed studies, that cannabis reduces the amount of narcotics that the person needs, and also it uh, reduces the, the buildup of tolerance to those pain killing effects. And what we're seeing in Colorado and dispensaries, uh, every you know dispensary has observed this, I'm sure, is that people who have been on high doses narcotics for years in some cases, and they, in many cases, completely stop using them. Nobody likes to be constipated, irritable, and addicted. And when they find out that there's actually something that doesn't have those negative qualities and actually is better for them, you know, again, this is an instance where you look what the people are telling you. Colorado is a laboratory. And what you find, and you certainly know this from your own experience, cannabis doesn't make the pain disappear. It puts it in a different place within your consciousness, so it doesn't bother you as much. Plus, the combination of the mood-elevating properties, you don't get into that depressive funk uh, that's associated with becoming essentially a, a drug addict. So why would our government create policies that foster drug addiction, which is certainly what happens with narcotics, and on the other hand, say it's illegal for us to use a plant that gives us relief inhibits the underlying biochemistry of so many problems. You know, there's something fundamentally flawed with our government. I mean, if we look, for example, at law enforcement, a good component of law enforcement is to do investigative work. You, you so heard... if they can't investigate the underlying science of cannabis, which is freely available, go to PubMed, it's a database generated by the National Institute of Health. That's P-U-B start looking at what's going on. If they cannot do that, well, then there's something fundamentally wrong with our law enforcement agencies that they can't determine reality from fiction, and they go out there and they spread a bunch of lies. Exactly, and so you brought up PubMed, which is P-U-B-M-E-D uh, dot com, is that right? Or yeah, you have to, 
you have to Google it because it's got a long name. Do a search for PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. P-U-B-M-E-D. And uh, it's a resource for a lot of uh, research papers that Dr. Robert Melamed is very familiar with. And it's a great place to uh, learn more about cannabis uh, as well as and many other things for that matter. Learn about your health. Really, the bigger uh, picture that we're trying to address here is taking responsibility into our own hands. Our health is something that we are responsible for, and uh, it's not about putting the our health or choices in the hands of a doctor on top of a pedestal, but somebody who's willing to have that conversation with us. Now, Dr. Bob, um, you brought up the relationship between research and government and how the government's preventing this. One of the things I, fa- I came across was uh, a Milton Freeman, uh, Friedman quote, uh, an economist, who said, if you really look at the drug war from a purely economic point of view, the role of the government is to protect the drug cartel. So, Dr. Bob, can you make a comment uh, about what, um, what I just brought up there in relation to the pharmaceutical industry, cannabis, and the drug cartels? Well, you know, let's look at reality. Congress has an approval rating of less than 10 percent. So the people in America realize that we got a bunch of incompetent clowns out there that are typically self-interested and self-benefiting and self-grandizing themselves. You know, while they vote for raises in the middle of the night on Fridays, so the people won't get too upset while they exclude themselves from the health care system that they impose on everyone else. Go so on and on and on. There's good reasons for the lack of respect there. For these people, and it's these same people that are only interested in getting reelected. I mean, we see as soon as you're elected, you start getting fundraising for the next reelection. And it turns out that pharmaceutical industries and law enforcement are both major contributors uh, to anything having to do with inhibiting uh, the progress of science and cannabis, and the reality of how it can benefit countless numbers of people. And we now have uh, law enforcement testifying in support of bills that uh, are against medical use. And so it's interesting that we have uh, people who are supposed to enforce law coming in and now trying to create law uh, in their favor and their benefit, which is affecting our health, our well-being, and our community. So um, exactly. so one of the big things that uh, I think I, I hope that we can can talk about more in the future, and and I, I welcome you back to Cannabis Health News Magazine, and I hope you will join us again. Um, I'm really pleased to have you here for the first show. Uh, we will be um, ending the show pretty shortly, and it's kind of kind of funny how fast uh, time flies by here. But um, Dr. Bob, I know that uh, you are all over the place. I actually just ran into um, a gentleman who. Also is uh, from your company, Cannabis Science, Robert Kane. And uh, I understand he's now working for you. I just want to give a good shout out to him and say hello. It's, it was good to run into the other night, Robert. And uh, welcome to Denver. It's nice to see you in a different state. So it, it sounds like you, you really have a good crew uh, on board with what you're pushing towards. I know that you have um, a Cannabis Science has a uh, public uh, stock that's available online. And I encourage people to check out their, your history. And, you know, it's uh, available anywhere. I mean, it's a publicly traded stock on the NASDAQ. CBIS is our symbol, and we're a fully reporting company. We're on the, we're on the bulletin board. That's CBIS. Mm-hmm. Great. So, Dr. Bob, just to tie all this stuff together, um, I know you have kids, and, and, and this is really tying the bigger picture together in terms of starting the conversation about a lot of what we've touched on here. And again, I think, you know, just this conversation is just the, the tip of the iceberg, just like the research. We really are just on that tip of the iceberg of knowing how much and where cannabis can affect our lives in very positive ways. So I know you have uh, two wonderful boys, and uh, I have a, a 12-year-old, a wonderful son, and um, a lot of people bring up the issue. They say, oh, it's about the children. We've got to protect the children. You know, there's the D.A.R.E. program, and uh, schools are very opposed to uh, people like myself in, in very interesting ways. I know we see uh, the situation with Chaz Moore. I am Bill Smith in Colorado Springs, a 17-year-old uh, teenager who has uh, myoclonus diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic flutter. I hope I got that right. And, um, I don't remember the name of it even. All I know is you've got a severe problem that kind of alleviates when nothing else does. Nuclear hiccups, I call them. So what do you have to say about the kids? Uh, just as a sort of a closing uh, comment and conversation here, because that is a hot topic, um, do you mind if we just touch on that briefly? 
Well, you know, I think there is an issue. You don't want kids using cannabis, to, you know, uh, in any random sense. But on the other hand, if my kid's got a fever and a sick and having pain, why am I? Why is it okay to give them addictive drugs or drugs that are going to kill your liver and kidneys for centuries and beyond? For thousands of years, cannabis has been used as medicine. So I object to the fact that I'm forced to use drugs that I know better uh, than to want to use with my children. I, I want to add also that it's not just that I have these young children. I also have a 42-year-old daughter. I've got 13-year-old grandkids. That's right. I forgot about your older daughter. I've got daughter. a 32-year-old daughter. And she's you know, a three-year-old along with twins. So I've successfully raised successful people and brought them into society in a way where they're, where they're wonderful distributors and wonderful people, and I'm so proud of them. And they all grew up with me, involved with cannabis. It was there for all of them. And same with these kids here. And my, my mom, before she died, said a family that smokes together stays together. Mm, that's very powerful. That's also a bigger part of the uh, children's conversation is that uh, nowadays the powers that be, media and educational department, law enforcement, they say, oh, you shouldn't talk about this stuff with your kids. Well, I think as a parent, it's my responsibility to talk about these things. Exactly. So, Dr. Exactly. Bob, we got to go to our commercial here. And thank you very much for joining us at Cannabis Health News Magazine. Sarah's Medicated Teas. With over 50,000 tea bags sold, Sarah's Medicated Teas have quickly become the most popular and effective way to medicate without smoking. Tea bags are made with loose leaf tea and fine hash keef, separated into four med bases in one third and one full gram strengths. Our keef infusion process has a consistent dose in each bag. Sarah's Medicated Teas come in 20 flavors. Enjoy hot or over ice. Sarah's Medicated Teas can be found in MMJ centers across the state of Colorado. Check out our website at www.mmjfarm.com www.mmjfarm.com Sarah's Medicated Teas When you need to medicate, it's tea time Hey, this is Stickman from Overgrow the Radio. Join us on April 20th at 10 a.m. at the Sylvan Theater in D.C. We're there to send a strong message to the feds once again for the second year in a row about their failed drug policy and the need to end it. Special guests include Sean Dunnigan from Leap, Jason Love from Cannabis Health News Magazine, yours truly, and many more to come. You can contact us at overgrowthegovernment.org or by email at stickman202210 at gmail.com. Please be in involved in whatever way you can. It will take us all standing together to end this madness. Peace. Hi, this is Elisa, and I'd like to invite you to join me and Stickman on Overgrow the Radio. We're going to be here on iCannabisRadio.com. Join us Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. This is Cannabis Health News Magazine. Thank you very much for coming back. We have just spoken with Dr. Robert Melamede and had a wonderful conversation touching on a whole spectrum of issues related to cannabis and kids and the economy and so on and so forth, please come back uh, and listen to more of our conversations with Dr. Bob. He will be joining us probably weekly at this point. Uh, there's a lot of information to get across. So that said, we also have Elisa Kappelman in the studio right now with us. And uh, if you don't know who she is, she is a caregiver from Colorado Springs. She used to own, as of uh, just a few days ago, uh, SoCo which is in Colorado Springs. It's still there. Oop, I lost my, my uh, headphones. You guys can still hear me, but my headphones are gone, so I can't hear you. Well, I guess I couldn't hear you in the beginning. So Lisa Kappelman is here, and uh, if you don't know anything about her case, please look it up online or join us for the next protest over at the El Paso County Courthouse uh, in Colorado Springs. So, Elisa, I know that uh, we're having a little audio difficulty, but let's just assume the world out there can hear us. Uh, because I can hear you, and you're sitting next to me. So, Elisa, welcome to our show, Cannabis Health News Magazine. It's happy to have you here. Hi. Hi, I'm very glad to be here today. So, I, I had a, a chance to uh, meet you, gosh, it's been a while now. I, I lose track of time. You know, honestly, it feels like one big day to me. It does. Doesn't it? Um, I think Elisa is one of those few people out there who really understands um, what I mean when I say that. So you're facing some heavy-duty time right now. You're being charged by D.A. Dan May, the district attorney down in Colorado Springs, 
for caring. I am. I am on charges of felony possession and felony cultivation, and I'm also charged with um, a concentrate. And I have been on charges almost two years. So originally your charges uh, stemmed from a raid or visits, whatever you want to call it. Honestly, from what I just saw on February 10th uh, from video from Colorado Springs Police Department, this is an onslaught. This is war, folks. These guys are coming in with 13 armed, fully armed guys with grenades, these flash grenades that leave shrapnel and animals and burned skin and, and fur. I mean, oh, my God. Sorry to, to jump into that, but this is this is opening the doors to a big conversation. And so you were visited by uh, the Colorado Springs Police Department before 1284 was implemented, yes. before red cards were being um, uh, issued by the state. Everything was still legal. You were still covered by Amendment 20, Article 18 of our Colorado Constitution. Yes. Tell us a little bit about uh, what happened in the beginning and what your intent was. Before you actually go there, give us a little backstory on why you became a caregiver? Um, what I did was I was working as a corporate trainer for Hewlett Packard, and I have my own issues. I have my own health issues. I've been hit by a car when I was a kid. And <clears throat> I've treated myself with cannabis for a very long time, and I was going to, when it became legal to grow your own, I thought, why not grow my own? And I looked into buying lights and things like that, and it was quite expensive. So I thought, if I'm going to grow for me, maybe I should just grow for a few other people. So you're one of those few people who realize that you can grow for yourself and, and acknowledge that a lot of people can't grow. So that's that's what I'm mm -hmm. hearing you say right off the bat. And yeah, it's expensive, isn't it? It I is. I realized that originally, too. And so originally when my partner and I went into business, we had we had three rules that we were looking at. We looked at the first rule was don't go to jail, which I violated. <laughs> and our second rule was to take care of some patients. Our third rule was to um, maybe make a little money, which we have yet to see. And um, we decided to grow for other people. And so we became, I became a caregiver and um, I had around 20 patients at the time that I was raided. And, and the, again, that was not violating any, any uh, laws at the time. 1284 was not in effect in terms of uh, being a caregiver and only having five patients. That's exactly right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we were within our plant count. Um, we had all the paperwork for our patients. Um, when we were raided by the police, um, there were other growers in the building. We had some that were a little careless. And um, one of them got robbed and he called the police and told the police that he had been robbed and that he, they weren't keeping a very good eye on the place because there was a lot of grows. So, so you said all in one, there's a lot of grows in one building, but just to be clear, just like any other business, just because you're in one building doesn't mean you're under one address. These are all different businesses. Mm -hmm. okay. We were in different suites. We all had different leases and some of them were caregivers. Some of them were actually working for dispensaries. And so we were very separate. Um, all the leases were separate. But when I was charged, they charged all of us in the bu same building as the same person. Um, it took us a year and a half to get the, the DA to say it was okay to separate our cases. And that just happened, uh, what was that, four weeks ago, if I remember yes. right? Yeah, I sat in and that was. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something, excuse me. Uh, that's something that um, I think is really important for all of you listeners out there. If you're part of the, the of this movement, of the cannabis movement, if you're interested in the cannabis movement, if you're skeptical of the cannabis movement and what cannabis can do for you, come sit in, observe these these hearings, observe these trials, try and find a center in your area and go visit with them. Have a yeah. conversation. Elisa is a wonderful woman. I really have had um, a really nice opportunity to get to know her over the last few months. And um, I would really hope that uh, you can come back and speak with us more on the show. I want to make sure that uh, people are aware that you are still facing trial, and it's coming up on June 4th. Is that right? Um, no, that's Bob Krause. Sorry. That's Bob Krause. Mine is June 7th. 27th. Oh, 27th. June 27th. And Bob Krause, uh, for those of you who don't know him, is also a patient, also being charged by Dan May, D.N. Dan May, in uh, Colorado Springs. 
Now, mm-hmm. just as a side note, um, I'll mention you know some of my case. I was charged uh, by originally DA Dan, or sorry, DA Mary Lacey in Boulder County, and that was followed up by DA Stan Garnett, who prosecuted my case. And uh, I did win that trial, and I'm here to support you, Elisa. I think that what you're doing is absolutely correct, absolutely right. It's um, ethical. You um, are a good person, and you mentioned earlier you came from a professional background and are a very um, educated person. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, you're compassionate. And uh, what I have to share with people out there, again, is that this this is really about helping other people. We're not trying to benefit ourselves. Um, So thanks again for joining us. I know this has been a a short, quick hit on the interview, but um, I'm happy you're up here. It's good to see you up here. Welcome from uh, Colorado Springs up to Denver. I really appreciate your support, Jason. It means the world to me. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, I'm here for you, totally. I'm here for Bob Krause, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, those of you out there, if you have a, a legal issue, I'm not an attorney, but I'm a patient, I'm an advocate, and I will speak to you, uh, with you about what your issues are. And if I can help you in any way, uh, just give me a call. Get in contact with me through CannabisHealthNewsMagazine.com, iCannabisRadio.com, which is our, um, our, our, excuse me, our sponsor. And you can check us out uh, on the web at iCannabisRadio.com. Again, thanks for joining us, Elisa, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks for having me. All right, Chris, thanks for producing this wonderful show for Cannabis Health News Magazine. We're going to jump into our sponsors, and up next, we've got Overgrow the Radio. Please join us for that show. If you could take a look at the bottom of the page on iCannabis Radio, if you're watching Cannabis Health News Magazine, there's a link right there that'll take you to the next show. See you next time.